Welcome to Big Blend Radio's Military Monday show. We are airing live from Eugene, Oregon. And, of course, as you know, Nancy and I travel across the country full time. And as we do this, as we document parks, public lands, and publish magazines, uh, we also pet it. So you may at some point get to hear a few <laughs> words from Jessie, the sweet little dog that we are taking care of. She's cross, what, part lab and part basset hounds. We haven't heard her really so howl cute. yet. But she could. But she could. Uh, <laughs> she but could. anyway, today we're really excited. You know, uh, Military Mike is on our show every first Monday. And Military Mike is Mike Guardia. He is an award-winning author, a military historian, a U.S. Army veteran. Uh, in fact, he's named uh, Author of the Year in 2021 by the Military Writers Society of America. His latest book, which is this 22nd book, uh, is the Combat Diaries, True Stories from the Front Lines of World War II. He's an incredible author. And we, mm-hmm. That interview, uh, by the way, we did that last month, and I encourage you to go listen to it. I also follow him on his YouTube channel and Facebook and Twitter. Um, but really, this book is incredible. And every time he has a new book released, Nancy and I are like, oh, my gosh, he just keeps getting better and better and better mm-hmm. as a writer and engaging us into – topics and parts of military history we had no idea we were interested in. So I thank you for that. Mike, how are you? Hey, hey, ladies, I'm doing great. Always good to be on the show. How y'all doing? We're, we're doing good. good. We're doing good and uh, excited to have you back on, and especially today. You know, we've been doing a lot of Zoom calls with you, but we're doing a live broadcast, and Memorial Day is coming up this month mm-hmm. in May. So I know we're going to mm-hmm. talk about that, and we have some special guests joining us on the show today, but I do want to give out your website, everyone. It's MikeGuardia.com. Also, check out, Mike is on the History Channel series called I Was There, and he is uh, cast as a historian on four of the episodes, Johnstown Flood of 1889, the Chernobyl Disaster, the Battle of Stalingrad, and the Oklahoma City bombing. In fact, we even just, uh, the anniversary of the bombing just happened, I was going to say maybe about a week ago. So Mm -hmm. that episode actually airs tonight. And so you can catch the replays, right, Mike, for those, um, they, you know, who don't catch it live. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can uh, can see it on demand at history.com and uh, it's even uh, available streaming on Amazon Prime. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. Well, congratulations on that. Hopefully you'll yeah. get more of those. We want to see more on the History Channel. It's very cool. Very cool. Uh, all right. So we are, we've got some amazing guests, as I was saying. Uh, we've got retired Navy commander and veteran pilot J. Doug Whitney and his wife, Nancy Hunter, joining us from Seattle. We met them about a couple of weeks ago. I can't keep up. <laughs> Something <laughs> um, like up that. In Seattle. So we're going to talk about his military service and also for her what it was like to be a mom and a wife um, on the other side of it, because that's something we always talk about is that military connection uh, between, you know, those who are serving, the families, and then the communities that they're living in, especially the families. So uh, excited about that. And I know, Mike, uh, you got a chance to read uh, Doug's bio, and it's pretty impressive, right, <laughs> what he's, he's done sure. in life. Yeah, really quite Certainly. impressive. Okay, I don't know. My, my, I, Nancy, can you hear me okay? Because I went in yeah. and out there, mm-hmm. I think. Okay, yeah, you good. did go. You you kind of disappeared. You all right now? It's raining in Oregon. Mm-hmm. That's all I can say. The rain <laughs> <laughs> washes, washes the words away. Uh, also, we have world champion horse trainer Christy Wood back on the show. She's our equestrian expert. Um, she's going to talk about her fundraising campaign with the Independence Fund to purchase another all-terrain wheelchair for a wood- wounded veteran. She's been doing this so for cool. a number of years and been very successful. And these uh, you know, wheelchairs... Um, they're like, you know, motor, it's like a little ATV, actually, and um, they're not um, inexpensive whatsoever. So it's quite an effort, and she's been successful at it, so we're really excited to have her back on to talk about what we can all do to help. And our friend Stephen Karen Wilson, owners of the Lion and the Rose Bed and Breakfast in Asheville, will be back on the show talking about some of, you know, what they do at Bed and Breakfast is I don't know if you know this, but bed and breakfasts across the country are really good of uh, campaigns for veterans and those who are deployed. And they're going to talk about uh, this campaign is called In Support of Our Troops, you know, in I-N-N, uh, and mm-hmm. where they're 
ins and uh, also their guests. They're, they encourage everyone to bake for deployed soldiers uh, who are out there, and they're doing this through the nonprofit called Soldiers Angels. And I know there's also a program over Veterans Day where veterans can uh, apply at different bed and breakfast to win a night stay in uh, a B&B for Veterans Day, which is cool. So, Mike, when you were out in service and deployed, did you get baked goods and goodie boxes and goodie bags? <laughs> uh, well, let's see. I think I remember the odd occasion getting a – care package or two um mm. yeah cool and uh but i will say this uh care packages are certainly a welcome break uh for any soldier no, no matter where they are and no matter what they're doing mm. i would say so i mean he doesn't and especially you know baked goods when someone's you know cooking mm-hmm. something with love Sending it over, yeah. I think that's something really, really special. So, well, let's get our first guest on the show. Stay tuned. Uh, we've got two new friends joining us on the show today, Jay Douglas Whitney and his wife, Nancy Hunter. Uh, Doug uh, attended Colorado University on a Navy ROTC scholarship and graduated in 1971 with a degree in aerospace engineering. So he's cool. really smart, and that's where mm-hmm. he's going to go. He's really <laughs> smart. Uh, and he was commissioned the same day as an ensign in the Navy and immediately entered flight training at the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. Nancy and I have been there, and we live there, mm-hmm. and, uh, but not on the not on the base. Uh, but he has done so much, um, and he's going to explain some of his career, uh, which is pretty lengthy. But that's just the beginning start of it. And um, he went on uh, as he he did light attack squadrons. Uh, he has traveled the world in the military. He was even uh, on the Navy staff in the Pentagon for two years. Uh, So we're really excited to have him on the show, and also his wife, Nancy, is going to talk about military life. But uh, first, welcome. Doug, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. It's good to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Nancy. Seattle, Mm -hmm. we have to call her Seattle Nancy, because we've got two Nancys (laughs) here. How are you, Nancy? I'm good. I'm good. Good. Thank How you. are the kitties? You know we love your kittens. <laughs> oh, I do know that. They're doing well. They miss cool. you. Oh, no, we miss them too. We miss them. Uh, I do. You know what? I, I've got to say this as military families because I know you are on the other side of this. Uh, Doug's off flying and and doing all this. You know these operations around the world. You know having pets did that help your family or did you not get to have pets? Oh no, we got to have pets, and yes, that did help the family. Mm-hmm. Yes. Cool. It, it was companionship. It required routine, and they were very loving. No, and and I'd say our family was mainly a cat family, but others mm. have their pets. Oh, cool. Well, yeah. Well, you got good kitties for sure. Um, mm, yeah. Doug, I, I wanted to go to you, and, and I'm so glad that Mike Guardia is here as guest co-host. You know, I don't even want to say the word guest because he's been on our show for years. He's he's family <laughs> co-host here, um, because as soon as We've met you, and you were talking about your service and show me that book of the mm. aircraft. I was like, oh, we've got mm. to call Mike now because, like, because <laughs> Mike has been on our show talking about is it the F-14s? Am I going to get the MIGs? Am I getting this right, Mike? 14s, F-15s that we were talking about? Right. Yeah. So far, so and, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. I was like going, hey, this is cool. We're, I didn't know about those until Mike was on the show. He taught us a lot. Um, but then I was looking, is it – so, Doug, is it an A7E Corsair II aircraft? That's what you, you were flying? That's what I flew operationally, yes. I flew m- many other different types at the Naval Air Test Center and other places, but my operational uh, carrier-based experience was uh, primarily in that airplane. Wow. Wow. So, hmm. when – okay, so you started – I mean, first, let's back up a little bit. What led you to say, I'm going to go into the military? 
<laughs> oh, I knew from a very young age that I wanted to fly. So all through hmm. my schooling, that was my objective, to do those things that would get me to that point. And when it became time to consider colleges, I looked at Air Force and Navy and different programs. The Navy had the best scholarship program, uh, so that's what I chose. Wow. Okay, so then awesome. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and so you go into this whole program, and then the aircraft that you went into, uh, the A7E Corsair II, so this is like a fighter jet, right? It's uh, uh, it's uh, a light attack airplane was how it was referred. Um, a single-seat um, carrier-based airplane designed primarily for ground attack, with a mm -hmm. secondary uh, air to air role. Okay, sneak wait. attack. Okay, yeah, sneak attack. Here we go. <laughs> Mike, when we talk about the F 14s, F 15s, where does this aircraft fly? And what, what's Doug talking about with light rolls? <laughs> okay, alrighty. So if you were talking about the F 14 and the F, and, and also the F. F-15, excuse me, um, th those are designated as fighters by the S prefix. Mm -hmm. And um, what each of those fighters uh, do is they are primarily designed for air superiority missions, and that means they are primarily designated for an air-to-air -air role. Um, but if you have an aircraft that is designated by the A prefix, then that means it's primarily an attack aircraft, and its primary mission is to attack targets on the ground. Um, but as as Doug alluded to, um, you know, th those designations um, are not necessarily set in stone uh, in terms of what the aircraft's capabilities are and what it can do if it needs to take on a secondary mission. Because as as you said with the A seven, it had a it had a secondary role as an air to air fighter. And uh you also see the same construct happening with the F fourteens and the F fifteens. Uh because the F fourteen, even though it was designed primarily for air to air missions, you know, you also had uh you you also had it adapted throughout much of the later years of its service history to be uh to be a ground attack aircraft. And uh, it took on a number of roles in support of its parent fleet. Uh, you know, it could it could be uh, it could very well be a ground attack aircraft one day. It could be an air to air fighter the next day. It could be doing reconnaissance missions on the day after. And uh, the same holds true for the F-15, in a large sense. That uh, you know, it was. Its whole mantra was not one pound for air to ground, but uh, you know, throughout its service life, it was adapted into a variety of roles. So much so that uh, they created an additional version of the F-15, the F-15 E Strike Eagle, which was a uh, which was a joint strike fighter, as they called it, which means that it could, uh, you know, from from the flip of a switch, go from air to air to air to ground, even in the middle of a mission. So, so when how does how does the military choose their or train their pilots? So are you trained in all facets of what the plane can do, or do they switch pilots because now we need to do this, now we need to do ground attack, now we need to do air fight, or does the pilot know how to do all of it? Yeah, that, that's, well, that's a good Doug, one for Doug. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, Doug can probably answer that better than I can. <laughs> yeah, we we trained for every conceivable mission. Mm -hmm. um, from close air support to long range strike to uh air to air intercepts um all of the different missions we we trained every day that was our job and our training evolution between deployments included training in in all aspects of uh, of the mission wow that's that's so all aspects and so when hmm. you were Training in the very beginning, did you do like simulations or did they put you in planes right away uh, in the very beginning of your career? We did spend time in simulators, uh, but and initially, of course, you fly with an instructor and and in the training command, especially and 
eventually you fly solo and you have different phases of training. You might start out with a familiarization, then you go into instrument flying, then you go into formation flying, then you go into tactical formation flying, then you go to air to ground uh, attack uh, types of missions, and then air to air missions, and then eventually you get to carrier qualifications. And that's usually the last thing you do before uh, graduation from flight training. Wow. wow. And then hmm. what's it left to go out? Like, okay, now here we are. Was that like kind of a, a fast thing to change from going from training into now I'm there and I'm in the sky and now we're going? I well, mean, even after one completes flight training uh, and is assigned to a particular airplane, then the pilot goes to what's called a replacement squadron and spends uh, – uh, six months to a year just learning the operational aircraft that he or she will be flying and all of the various aspects of that mission as well. So between entering flight training and getting to the first operational squadron is at least two years. Wow. Okay. And that's, a, you know, it's, to me it's like it's wild to think about going for it, you know, and I want to go to Nancy here and we're going to, so we're going to step off the aircraft for a second <laughs> because I want to go to you, Nancy, when you first met Doug, did you know like what your life was going to be like? I mean, you guys fall in love, you get married, but like, did you have a military family experience beforehand? No, I, I did not, but my, my dad fought in World War II, um, but he obviously was out way before I was born. Um, I married Doug 10 years into his career. Uh, I I don't think I quite gathered the, you move every two and a half years, you have automatic friends because all the wives are in the same situation. You have um, meetings, you talked about care packages. So we would have meetings and we'd come up with clever ideas to send care packages like if we're a seven-month cruise, <clears throat> we might have everybody put lipstick on and kiss a date, and then the guys had to guess whose lips they were, <laughs> and th things like that, um, which was very That's fun. Funny. We, you know, we're missing them greatly, but we felt connected by sending care packages, personalized care packages like that. It was a fun activity. Wow. I, I'm glad you're going to stay on for a little bit longer on our show so you can chat to some, you know, the folks who are doing these kind of packages, you know, and doing that. But how long did was Doug gone with you at home with the kids? Oh, well, in a year's time, I figured it out. For seagoing duty, he was gone 80% of the time. So in a year, he would go out for two months to do what they call workups, so like practice, and then <clears throat> maybe home a month and then gone seven months uh, on cruise. And if there was any issue, sometimes it got extended. If there were little issues in the world that they had to kind of protect, or it might be longer. So you never knew. And back in those days, there weren't computers. It's not like I could text or email or even really pick up a phone and call them. We communicated when he pulled into port and uh, the time difference always threw us. We didn't always get to talk to each other each time we called. And one time, well, Doug told me I accidentally called an admiral's room. <laughs> he probably heard about that. I forgot I did that one, but I guess I had the wrong phone number. Wow. <laughs> wow, that is funny. That is like, you know, hello. <laughs> Hi, baby. <laughs> you know, I'm looking for Doug. Funny. He's not here. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. And, Doug, you know, when you were in different countries, did, well, let's see, Nancy, did you go overseas with the family, or were you always based in the States? Yep. Well, Doug was actually based in the Philippines, and he had just come back from that three-year tour when I met him in California. So he did a tour abroad. Yeah, but while Nancy and I were married, we were always uh, stationed in the States. Um, however, there were a few times when we managed to meet up 
while I was deployed in the middle of a deployment. One time was on the island of Mallorca for several days, and that was lots of fun. And, and again, when I was in Japan and we went to Hong Kong. Um, so there were some times where we got to see each other, but it was few and far between. Wow. Wow. That's got to be tough. I mean, for you, Doug, is that tough, too, because you're out in the field? Was that tough to, you know, think about your family and your two boys, because you had two boys, too? Well, the psychology of that kind of life is is one of the most interesting aspects of it. The psycho- psychology of, of, of approaching a deployment and going into it, and then returning again and finding yourself in a almost a strange circumstance. Um, I found that preparing for a deployment, I unconsciously began to detach from it, it for a period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's not something that's conscious, but I think it's, mm-hmm. it, it definitely happens in a lot of cases. You're thinking about you know, I'm going off on this uh, new and exciting adventure, and it's it's a, a whole new life. And coming back, and it's all like you're entering an old life, but it it also you know, also seems almost new again. Oh man, that's yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of I know. I mean, Nancy and I can't you know ever compare it to it, but it's very like for us traveling. You're out. Then you come back in, it's like this, your brain goes in this in and out thing of, it's just, it's so different. It's so different. Did you feel the same way, Mike, you know, for you when you were out on deployment and coming back? Oh, goodness, I was, well, I was never gone anywhere for nine whole months out of the year. I mean, <laughs> oh, wow. And, uh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, and uh, gosh, I can't. I can't even imagine being away for 80% of the time. So, um, but uh, yeah, I will say that uh, I, I will say that the op tempo uh, that our military uh, has been at, well, or was at until recently, you know, over the uh, past 20 years of continuous conflict, uh, took an incredible toll on families and an mm-hmm. incredible toll on all of the servicemen themselves. And um, one thing that I do credit our military for and one thing that I also credit our nation for at large is uh, taking uh, more of an investment in trying to reintegrate a lot of the returning veterans into normal everyday life because uh, I think in conflicts uh, past that uh, was always something that was kind of an afterthought but uh, you know for uh, for the uh, for the conflicts that we have been in for for quite a while now, um, it, it, uh, it really seems to have taken forefront as a priority, you know, to help um, any stripe of returning veterans to be able to reintegrate and, you know, be able to get the uh, proper mental health care that they need. Mm. I, I want to go to Nancy with that. Seattle, Nancy, um, what do you think about that in regards to your experiences being the families on the family side? I'm not saying Doug's not family, but I'm not just, I'm just saying for those I who are at it. home, because I think there's, um, we, I, I think that, in, you know, this is my own personal opinion from my experiences. We, you know, Nancy and I have lived in 29 Palms and Oceanside, California, and different military areas across this country and, and around the world, too, um, that there's often, the, I mean, there's a disconnect between the civilian and military life, but then also the families. I wonder how many times that they're almost forgotten about those who are living on the base or even just off the base in an area um, that we need to kind of remember that they need that help too. You know what I mean? Of suddenly, yeah. oh, you know, Doug's home now. Everything changes in the house. No offense, Doug. <laughs> but you know what I mean? <laughs> no, but that's a good point. Two points there. Um we found that there were particular times when some of the wives and families had a hard time, and we had a, I don't know what to call a mediator, facilitator, an ombudsman mm. was the title, who would go and help them, whether it was like balancing a checkbook or helping to deal with um, <clears throat> some health issue, 
they they would go and help us. They just couldn't handle it. So, and along those lines, when Doug was gone, we just happened to have a couple of kiddos there, and I have to tell you, they're very, very healthy now, but they were very sick, and they would be in the hospital for a seven-day stay, and I didn't have family near, and they're only 20 months apart. That was very hard. Um, I tried to work during that time. Um, Another interesting aspect of when Doug was at home versus not at home, when Doug leaves, then all of the responsibilities were left to me, which is fine, and I'm a highly capable person. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if all wives are, and so when he came back, it was like, oh, you're back. Oh, you're going to mow the yard now. Oh, okay. I don't have to mow the yard now. Cool. <laughs> or or the car breaks down and like, oh, you're going to fix the car. Or you're going to call somebody. So it, it, just the roles you had, you there were always changing. <clears throat> mm. Anyways. Wow, wow. So I think there's, I, I wanted to also go back to Mike on this. You know, Mike, when you were writing about Hal Moore, um, you know, just the infamous Hal Moore, his wife really kind of mm-hmm. also saw what the family front was going through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, she sure did. And, um, you know, it is really a testament to how strong military spouses can be, um, you know, and uh, that, uh that applies e- 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 equally to husbands who are married to women who are active duty military. You know, it's mm. a, uh, it is, it is quite mm. an enormous task for anyone mm-hmm. to be a military spouse because you have to do all, all, almost everything that Nancy said, you know, you are essentially pulling double duty um, whenever your spouse is out on training maneuvers or whether they're out on a deployment or uh, if they're away from home for any extended period of time, you know, it's, uh, it's always rough. And, you know, it, um, it, it really, in my opinion, it reinforces the strong sense of community that military spouses share and uh, yeah. how those, and how those bonds are the strongest that, some people will ever make and they carry forward until long after the other spouse has left the military. Mm. You know, I I just want to interject one thing. When I was deployed, we mail was our primary means of staying in contact. Um, And it was sporadic on when we were deployed on the carrier, we might get mail once a week if we were lucky or every two weeks or maybe less often. And and most of the, my squadron mates, they might get one or two letters each time the mail came aboard. But my mailbox was always full. <laughs> I, I'm sure Nancy wrote about one letter per each day I was deployed. Wow. And uh, I have to give her tremendous credit. It really helped us maintain um, our connection and kept me informed as to what was going on uh, at home. Uh, so that helped a lot, and I confess that I was not quite as diligent. Oh, you were really busy, though, Doug. You were putting in 14, 16-hour days, seven days wow. a week. Wow. Doug, would, would you, you were doing that many hours while, fi- like, in a fighter pilot mode, like that many hours? We Yeah, well... The ship is deployed seven days a week when we're at sea, and yes, we did take Sundays off normally, and we did not fly, but otherwise we would fly twice a day, uh, or uh, pretty much, and we had to plan each mission and brief, debrief. Uh, a lot of the times, we our first flight would be in the morning, and then we might not fly again until 9 o'clock that night and get uh, land about midnight and get ready to go the next day. Uh, and besides that, we had our ground jobs. We had a, uh, you might be the maintenance officer or the operations officer or the administrative officer or, or one of the branch officers. So. That was on top of all of our flying and planning and briefing and debriefing and all of that. Wow. 
So being on an, the um, aircraft carrier, so I wanted to kind of touch on that because that was something I needed to understand, and I'm sure there's a lot of people who don't understand all these terms and everything like, like me. And that's part of why we're doing this show is just for all of us to understand, um, you know, when we were visiting with you, you were talking about aircraft carriers, and it didn't quite dawn on me until a little later, and I'm like, oh, wow, you were on those those big ship things out in sea. Here's the word things. <laughs> those big things out in <laughs> sea. So, like, you forget about how warfare happens where, you know, the the crafts have to land on there. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, because Mike has done so much in regards to tanks. And, like, Mike, we've talked about in the Pacific Theater, you know, especially during World War II, like how they got, how did mm-hmm. they get their tanks there? What? How did all of this happen? So when when you're out, like so the, you would use that kind of like your landing strip, and also to be able to be to move for different locations for the sneak attack. Like <laughs> I gotta get this in my head. <laughs> well, if for the aircraft carrier, we had airplanes um, for transporting other kinds of equipment, tanks or uh, whatever uh, artillery. Uh, there is a there are a whole another class of ships uh, that are amphibious support ships of various kinds, and some of those carry helicopters and vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. But the amphibious navy is uh, operates pretty much separately from the carrier navy. Wow. Okay. So this is it's amazing. I mean, Mike, this. We're learning every single day, I think, with all of these shows we're doing of all these different pieces of equipment and how things move around uh, the world, literally. Um, so, Doug, the other part I wanted to go to, so you, you're in the, this aircraft, right, and then you went to be an, an engineering test pilot and then also the Navy staff at the Pentagon. And I know this right. is something, yeah, I mean, so what were you doing there? I mean, were you briefing them on different strategies? Am I allowed to ask? What you well, on the, when I was at the Pentagon, I worked in an office in the, uh, on the staff of the Chief of Naval Operations, and our job was to evaluate proposed systems, um, or whether they were ships or airplanes or command and control systems, various things, and recommend priorities for future procurement. So that's, so Mike, we were talking about a little bit about this before, about having, you know, people that were in the military, obviously like Doug, who were experts, like would go in and explain different things, but also with aircraft, right? So does this kind of all tie together, but at a Pentagon level? You know, it's vital right. to have it's vital to have operational experience in the places where those procurement decisions are made. Mm-hmm. So, so have those things. and then isn't it also the same when we talk about you know the aircraft? I know when we were talking about F-14s, F-15s, and then maybe the Corsair too. Like, because this is what blows our minds too that these planes and different, you know, armor get sold to different countries. And then, I mean, later, years later, we're going, oh, my, now we're we're in a skirmish with them, but they've got our old planes or something or our, our old jets. But at that same time, you travel around. Like, if we sell something, then there's got to be someone from our side that helps train, right? Did you do that, Doug, like with, with any of the – aircraft that you flew that did any of that get sold and were you there to help them there were navigate? Other, there were other countries that bought that particular airplane i was never involved in the training but you're right there part of the foreign military sales uh, includes training in both maintaining and operating the equipment okay wow so yeah, this is this is interesting about the whole buy sell buy sell. Do you think this is something that will stay on, Doug, in regards to all of you know our armor and stuff? But as we look at what's happening now to Russia and Ukraine, would we? I mean, we are 
sending things over right now to Ukraine, but do you think we'll start being more wary or no? Or is this something that is just normal? Practice? Well, I, I think we're always wary about who we sell things to. Sometimes that doesn't work out. For example, the Iran flew uh, and may still be flying a version of the F-14 that was sold to them many years ago. Um, but primarily we sell equipment and training to our friends and allies. Mm-hmm. So, Mike, this is something you've written a lot about in regards to mm-hmm. our, our equipment every, going everywhere. <laughs> it's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it is always an enormous gamble when you do it because your friend today could very well be your enemy tomorrow, and we've seen that play out a couple of times. You know, um, it's pretty much as Doug mentioned. You know, we 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 gave the F-14 to the uh, Iranian Air Force, and it wasn't but just a handful of years later that they became our number one sworn enemy in the Middle East, and uh, the the change was so drastic, it seemed to have happened at the drop of a hat, where they were our closest ally at the beginning of the decade, and by the end of the decade, they were public enemy number one. And uh, I think adding insult to injury was that the F-14 wasn't the only plane that we had given them. You know, we had given them the F-4, the F-5. We had given them a uh, slew of ground equipment. And, uh, you know, that holds true for some of the other militaries that we have, uh, that we have financed and supported and, uh, you know, g- g- conducted um, FMS operations to, you know, it, uh, it's, um, it's, it's good in the sense that we're able to, uh, you know, maintain a spirit of goodwill with other militaries of the world. But the flip side of that coin is that you take a gamble and that uh, you have no guarantees that, tomorrow or 10 years from now or however long it's going to be that uh, they, that uh, they may be using your your uh, your very own equipment against you. Wow, that's not that. Have, have you seen that at all, Doug, in, in your service? Um, well, going back to Iran, I remember we had to be wary of the, the Hawk surface-to-air uh, missile which, again, we had provided to Iran and was a very effective system uh, that was definitely, we considered a threat to us. Mm. Um, and, well, uh, as far as other examples, I can't think of any where equipment ended up in the hands of enemies. Mm. Um, it just doesn't come to me right now. Mm. You know, it, it's just it's fascinating to think about, you know, how many different levels of operation and tactics and sneak attacks, as we say, right, Nancy? <laughs> sneak attacks. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it's kind of uh, it's just, from our side, it's always just it's fascinating and it, with a lot of respect for the amount of strategy that goes into all of this. And I think that's something that, you know, you know, Doug, I know that you've had other careers, too, but. Has that has that strategy, learning strategy, and that kind of discipline from the military helped you? Oh, discipline! Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, I developed habit patterns that I maintain to this day. Mm, see, that's and what about you, Mike? I was going to ask you the same thing, and especially even with all the writing mm-hmm. that you're doing and everyone you're interviewing. Yeah. Yeah, um, when I look back on my military service, I really think that discipline is the number one thing that I got out of it. Um, Now, of course, there are times when you will start to chafe under the discipline, (laughs) and um, I I know that Doug can probably back me up on that one, but uh, it, uh, it, it really does help you establish routines, and it helps you organize your mind, and uh, yeah, it is a... uh, it, it, it's it's not always a fun experience to be in the military, but um, when you look back on it, it is uh, it's always something that I think every veteran is proud that they've done, and uh, you, you just can't argue the fact that you take away a lot of good qualitative things from your military service going forward. Mm. So you know, I wanted to ask you, Nancy, too, on the military mother side, <laughs> the mother and wife side. I know that 
you've also you know been in the education field. Being on in, in the trenches as as the mom and wife has that taught you skills in life for your career and just in life in general. Well, it did, and I was very fortunate being the job I had in special ed. I could go pretty much in the two-and-a-half-year moves that we would do and get a job. And I know a lot of my friends who had teaching credentials, they would end up subbing for a year or more. You just couldn't always walk into a job. Um, Anyway, but, but yes, you did have to – Manage your time well because especially when the guys were gone, you were it. You were everything. And you know there there are single parents out there that do it too. But mm. so yeah, yeah. Them credit. There, there are. I mean, and I love Mike too saying you know that it's a spouse is male and female serving. You know, so um, I think there's that too that um, we've got to look at. You know, so many women are serving. As well, uh-huh. and that's a is a huge part of it that we also forget about. I think, and some of them. I mean, I look at what they're doing training wise. I'm like, holy cow, man! Excuse my language, but they're badass. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, they're, they're they're they're. I mean, wow, you know, it's like okay. It's just so it's it's really interesting to see women do so much. And uh, Mike, as we've talked on the shows before, there's a lot of women just throughout history. I mean, just in you know old wars in this country of women getting in there and sneaking to be male uh, soldiers, you know, to to be able to serve. Right. So women have been, you know, they've been part of this for a number of years. But, you know, this show, you know, we we started the show talking about we wanted to talk about Memorial Day coming up. And it's something important. We we look at Veterans Day, Memorial Day, and there are two different – I don't even say holidays because it's you know it's it's a different it's an observance and and it's about honor and respect and so I wanted to ask you Mike um, the Memorial Day where did that come from before you we all called in we were talking about this like you know now Memorial Day seems like it's every car and uh, furniture store has a sale and I think we need right. to talk about what Memorial Day really is about because wasn't it started like after World War One or was it World War Two? Right. So what we have with Memorial Day is a federally recognized holiday that is that is supposed to give us pause to remember those who have sacrificed their lives in in uh, any number of the armed conflicts that our nation has been in. And, uh, you know, if we if we go back to. if we go back to the historical precedent of it, you know, it was uh, it, it actually starts well beyond the First World War, you know, all the way back to the 1860s, in fact. And uh, traditionally, um, throughout most of its history, it was observed on May 30th, but uh, it was a national day of remembrance. And it is it, it is distinguished from Veterans Day in the sense that Veterans Day is supposed to honor all the veterans who are both living and who, who have passed on, whereas Memorial Day is specifically geared to remembering those who have who have lost their lives in any number of armed conflicts. And uh, that's really what it is. It's supposed to, uh, it's supposed to be a day that we take to reflect on those who have made the ultimate sacrifice. And kind of alluding to what you said, you know, in terms of, you know, it's becoming kind of a commercialized holiday. Well, you know, I, I think we can say that for a lot of the holidays that we have here in America. But, uh, you know, it, it's um, it's supposed to go beyond, you know, the traditional celebrations and the bake sales and the discounts and everything else. And it's supposed to remind us that, uh, you know, so many have made that ultimate sacrifice and that it was something that a big swath of the American population um, had to take seriously because to an extent we all had skin in the game because for much of our, our history as a nation, we were a conscript force and there was a peacetime draft and everyone knew that if you were an able-bodied person and uh, you stood a very high probability of, 
uh, of being drafted into a term of service. And, uh, you know, given the, uh, given the geopolitical climate of the world mm-hmm. th- through, throughout most of the 19th and 20th century, you know, uh, the, uh, the possibility of going to war with another conventionally armed force was something that was very, very likely to happen. So, mm-hmm. yeah. I just I'm I just kind of feel like we need to get over the the sales things, you know. I just I just feel like it it maybe somebody try to do something nice and get you know veterans discounts, but we really we need to kind of remember and there's so many memorials and you know as we travel the country we're documenting parks and public lands and so many parks even if you go to a national park like Yosemite um there's going to be a memorial site somewhere or next to it. Um, and so that's something to us that is something to take time out. Read those names. You know, even if you don't know who those names are, go look it up. Um, so many cemeteries have memorials, and um, Nancy and I are creating a map of all the memorial sites we've been to, which has been, I, it's got to be over 100 now across the country. And all the communities, they seem to be connected to courthouses for some reason, my, these memorials. It's almost like mm. the courthouse is the next thing. It's like, you know, when the town becomes a town, then the courthouse is a part of it. Like, then it's like, okay, now we're putting a courthouse because there's, there's drama going on in the community. You know, <laughs> somebody's done something. So now we, it's part of like becoming a town or a city. And then that's where a lot of the memorials are, which is really kind of interesting, that or some of the community parks. Um, so it, it, to me, go to them whether or not it's your family in there. Um, it's a good thing. And we're seeing a lot for, of women. Uh, there was one park, uh, Memorial Park outside. It's, I was going to say it's east of Atlanta, a couple, two to three hours east of Atlanta. And um, it was a memorial site for World War One and Two veterans and had a whole section dedicated to women of World War Two, which I thought was pretty amazing because you don't see a lot of that either. But um, Nancy and Doug, you both came back from Hawaii and, you were saying that you saw the big memorial out out there. There was like a, a really big one. Um, I don't know which one it was that you. But it was like a. It was at the part of Pearl Harbor, maybe. We weren't at Pearl Harbor. We were on Kauai. And Nancy, where was that memorial? Oh dear! On live radio, you're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> I'm passing the buck here. I'm throwing well, you under the bus. Yes, you are. Well, there's got to <laughs> so be a lot of back under. <laughs> so at 2 a.m., I'll come up with it. <laughs> okay. I've got to just check if, if um, our Nancy is here. Big Blend Nancy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, good. She's finally here. We've had – we've had. Um, anyway, <laughs> she's here. <laughs> we finally got her back. <laughs> she was listening, but we couldn't get her voice out there, but she's back. Awesome. That's awesome. But – um, yeah, she was she was taking care of Jesse. <laughs> anyway, but the memorial sites, um, I know Hawaii's got to have a bunch. Um, Mike, is that something when we go to a memorial site, it, you know, it, it, that's got to be something that also on the military bases, are they there on the on oh, the yeah. bases themselves? Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, they are at various places throughout every military installation I've been to. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm. It's something to go to and, and really think about. And the veterans, so when we go to a veterans memorial, is it, would it be different than a, in, a, to me, isn't it all the same? Because Veterans Day is more for those who are served and who are still serving, right? Or retired, but are alive. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, my grandmother taught me um, that whenever you saw a, a person in uniform, whether it be a policeman or a military, a woman or a man, that you should always go up, introduce yourself, and then say, may I tap you on the shoulder as a thanks. That's what she taught me to do. And sometimes it's, yeah, and sometimes it's really um, emotional, and sometimes you you wish you hadn't done it because it comes as a shock. To the other person, but I always mm-hmm. thought it was kind of sweet, and she always she drummed it into my head that if two and four are military, 
specifically, we would all be goose stepping. That's what you used to tell me. You'd all be goose stepping, and you wouldn't have freedom. And and it, um, it's, I just really remember that about that. And she would always nod her head. Sometimes she would actually go and buy. I don't know why. There, there must be a reason, but. She would go buy this tomato sauce and put it in their cart if they were shopping. I don't know. She'd just go, here. And she'd pay for it and say, here, this is paid for it. Give them a receipt. I don't know. But she just, she had this thing mm. about giving thanks for military. Mm. And then I, you also know, I, for police. Yeah, of course I have encountered uh, those kinds of things. I think if it seems authentic, I, uh, that it's really appreciated. Mm-hmm. Often, though, it seems a little perfunctory um, mm-hmm. and and not necessarily authentic. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, that's just me. There's a mm-hmm. lot of, um, you know, military friends we have and people we know who say, I don't even, don't come to me with, you know, thank you for your service. They're like, don't do it. Like, which yeah. is, you know, you go, well, why, you know, because it's become kind of a, just a thing to say instead of Mm -hmm. the meaning behind it, you know? And so it's kind of this weird conversation to have about Mm -hmm. where are we? It's the same thing as what, you know, the Memorial Day sale. And Mm -hmm. so it's about really truly giving, or are you saying what you're supposed to say? The typical Mm -hmm. thing is, you know what I mean? So it's a very, um, what do you think about that, Nancy? I mean, it's a hard road. I mean, because we want people to, we want those we want the lines to not be so we don't want a big gap between civilian and military yet i know right. that there's dark there you know i have a friend whose family is in the military and she says there's parts of my military family that you do not want them in the civilian world <laughs> they, they just oh. don't need yeah all right then <laughs> for what they do and and their specialties and they are yeah, it, it's a. I was like, whoa, um, but she, she's got a, you know, I mean, every, you know, every kind of uh, branch of border patrol, uh, drug, narcotics people, the whole thing. So, you know, if we go see her, she still lets us have a glass of wine. And it's like mm. I'm, just, I'm spending the night if I have one glass of wine here. But um, <laughs> you know, what I mean? but her family, she says, there's a, there's a, there's just different. I don't know. It's, there's something. What can we do, Nancy? What do you think? Because you know, you you kind of understand, I think, more of what we can do on the civilian side. That's right. That would make sense. Oh my! <clears throat> yeah, it's all on your shoulders. Yeah, here I am again <laughs> I under the bus. The on you. <laughs> um, maybe maybe my thought isn't quite as much as Doug's, and I'll have to say, I don't get a lot of people saying thank you for your service. Mm. Even though I didn't serve in the military, but, I mean, you've heard that mm. it's gone 80% of the time. It it, it was um, challenging. Um, but when I do get it, and I'll have to tell you, there's some uh, hardware stores that give rewards to um, military when you check out, and they they will look at me. I'm the only one there, Doug's not there, and they will say, thank you for your service. And they might even go on to say, I can relate. I was in the service at one time, and they will tell me their story, or my husband mm-hmm. was in the service, or a relative was. So I, I feel fine when people mm-hmm. say thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, but it doesn't. It happens pretty rarely. Mm. Um, I I don't know what to yeah. say about what people would say to make me, to me to make me feel good about it. I um, authenticity. Mhm. I think it's about integrity of, of mm. your words and your actions. You know, Mike. What about you? How do you feel about well, it? Well, you know, I uh, well I. I have always appreciated it whenever anyone has thanked me for my service. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, I've noticed that uh, the frequency with which it happened declined as the, uh, as the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq tended to draw to a close. Mm -hmm. Because I remember when I first entered the military, it was that first decade of nine 11 
and, uh, you know, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were still going at full steam. And when I was a brand new lieutenant, any time I was out and about in uniform, I mean, it was multiple times that I would, uh, I would be thanked for my service. You know, I mean, I would have people coming up to me and they would offer to buy me a drink or they would say, mm. hey, thank you for what you do for us or, hey, you guys are doing a great job. You're doing a bang up job. And uh, let's see, as time went on, as um, you know, as I became a captain and I, I, uh, I, I transitioned into reserve duty, you know, when I was with my reserve unit and uh, we would take a break during our drill weekends to go have lunch. You know, by this time it was like 2016, going on 2017, um, you know, the, uh, the glances or the, uh, or the hearty handshakes grew a lot fewer and farther between. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I think a lot of it, I think a lot of it is a function of the times and I think mm-hmm. it, it tends to wax and wane, uh, as a function of, uh, you know, whether or not we are engaged in a conflict or whether or not there's a conflict in recent memory. Mm-hmm. Wow. I agree. I think it's got what's going on in the news and, you know, I think right now with what's happening in Ukraine, you know, what Russia's doing, you know, people are seeing what war does again and, it's kind of a reminder. Home, we, a reminder of what mm-hmm. people go through in war, what it's like to serve the fear, you know, and mm-hmm. um, what freedom really means, you know. So I think mm-hmm. it's fresh on us now. But um, we're going to bring our next guest, Christy Wood, on in a, in a couple minutes here. But we've got a little music break. And uh, we picked this song for you, Doug. Um, oh. <laughs> yes, this is called Wings of Fire Thank you. from an amazing guitarist. Um, he is a guitar virtuoso from Europe, Misha Shellhoff, and uh, he's now living in 29 Palms, <laughs> which is <laughs> funny. Uh, we, you know, we still haven't met him, and even though we were in lockdown in 29 Palms and, and during COVID. <laughs> Um, but he he's over there now, and uh, he's got an amazing crew of musicians, uh, like Chad Wackerman that was on here. Just an incredible album. This is his first EP, and it's called Wings of Fire. And I know I played this for you too, Mike. When I think what mm-hmm. I think it was uh, Tomcat Fury. Was it that? I think when I know when you were on the show in 29 Palms, I'm like we have to play this. And so I thought of uh, Doug with you being you know a pilot and. We, we've got to play this. So here's Wings of Fire. Enjoy it. It's a few minutes long, and then we'll get Christy Wood on, a uh, equestrian expert that is raising funds for an all-terrain wheelchair for a wounded veteran that's come home. So stay tuned, and uh, let's thank take a little you. music break. Yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you. Stay, it was very fun. Yeah, stay, stay on the line.
Radio special Military Monday show with Nancy and Lisa, publishers of Big Blend magazines, and also, uh, of course, hosts of Big Blend Radio and travelers on the Love Your Park tour. Uh, you just heard uh, Misha, uh, Misha Shellhouse, and that uh, song is Wings of Fire. We wanted to play that, especially for Doug Whitney, who's on the show with his wife, Nancy Hunter. Of course, we've got Mike Guardia in as co-host, but i got to give Misha a shout-out. That was his first EP, and uh, you can go to MishaMusic.com and uh, for his first EP. I mean, he's, he's a guitar virtuoso. He teaches. He's toured the world. Uh, but he did his Carl Verhagen on there from Supertramp. Uh, Chad Wackerman uh, on drums from Frank Zappa also uh, performed with Stevie Vai and Albert Lee. That was Dave Morota on bass from B.B. King and Phil Collins. And Jim Cox on Hammond B3, uh, who performs with Willie Nelson and Mark Knopfler. And that was recorded at Sunset, Sunset Sound in Hollywood. And um, we haven't played his music for a while. I, I, just I know. I cool. doing live radio shows. But, uh, Doug, I, I'm so glad you're still here. Doug, when you hear, like, would music help you get in, like, as a pilot? Can you, and if you're in that zone where now you have to take, like, sneak attack and take someone down, music doesn't belong in your head, or does it? Well, I, I did listen to a lot of music when I was deployed, but I tended toward music that would be calming and uh, put me into a, a more relaxed state mentally. Mm. Ah, yeah. And what about you, Mike? I mean, did you ever listen to music to get through what you were about to do or going through or doing? Oh, of course. Of course. Yeah. Of course. As a matter of fact, um, my tank crewman figured out a way to splice the wires of the first generation iPods that we had and route them through the tank's intercon system so <laughs> we could all jam the ACDC while we were going out to do <laughs> you know, well, Cool. I, I could hear well, like we hell's bells just yeah. blasting, like yeah. hell's bells. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh-huh. it's like... <laughs> and there was also a way to hot mic it in order to broadcast what was playing inside of our tank to the other tanks in the platoon, which no was way. also kind of fun. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we could, yeah, the uh, a lot of the radio <laughs> com had, um, they were, they were very, very useful in how they could be manipulated for entertainment value. But, mm. you know, at the same time, you had to be careful because if any higher-ranking commander would jump down to the platoon's net and, you know, he would hear, like, right of the Valkyries, you know, as we were going out to do a mission, that would that would probably <laughs> not go over well once you got to the briefing room. Yeah. You're sounding, oh, boy. You're sounding like MASH, you know. I know. I know. I was just going to say, Doug, um, if you knew Mike, would you, would you, you know, get him in trouble? I know Mike was Army, though, so you, you wouldn't be able to do anything, right? <laughs> Did you guys do that in in the? Could you do that kind of thing? Like, you know, get... I we could do that, and there are some guys who did, um, particularly on a long transoceanic flight, which we did on occasion with uh, in-flight refueling, and we might be in the air for six hours. Some guys mm-hmm. did wire their. Uh, it wasn't iPods then, but they were little cassette tapes and wire mm-hmm. it into their. Um, uh, headsets. Wow. Uh, but I ne- I didn't do that because it, I found it to be a distraction, and I wanted to be alert to cues that that I needed to be alert to, like mm-hmm. variations in engine sound or or whatever. I just thought it it was mm-hmm. not good to introduce a distraction to what mm-hmm. I did to pay attention to. How did you stay awake doing those big, long flights? Like, transatlantic, when you're going over the ocean, I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. How did, I mean, I just know from the, I do really crazy long drives across the country and, you know, up and down and all around. And there's, the gummy bears is not working for, you get a sugar high, then you crash, and Nancy's like, I told you not to eat the gummy bears. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you stay awake for those kind of, like, long flights? I you know I didn't have a problem with it. I, I think some guys have, and I've heard of cases where uh, a couple of pilots who have actually fallen asleep. But oh. uh, yeah, that I did not have a problem with that. Um, I was always I always managed to stay alert. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. 
All right, so we've got our next guest joining us, Christy Wood. Everybody stay tuned. Uh, we're going to chat with her about what she is doing to raise funds for an all-terrain Wood is our big blend equestrian expert, and yes, we've actually been out on horses with Christy, and um, she <laughs> treats her horses amazingly, and mm-hmm. she takes safety as first. In fact, we just did a uh, Success Insider Q&A with her. Uh, Mike, you've done one with us, uh, you know, on being a military historian and writer, and um, mm-hmm. it is, you can check it out. Go to blendradioandtv.com. She is a world champion horse trainer, a horse show judge with seven mm-hmm. breed associations. She's an author of two books. She's the owner of Wood and Horse Training Stables in Three Rivers, California, right at the entrance of Sequoia National Park. And that's where we met her when she took us out mm-hmm. on the trail ride. And it was really cool. We're both, we both used to have horses in South Africa. And um, it's just, Christy's been on our show for years, and we're glad to have you back. Christy, how are you? I'm fine. Uh, welcome and hello to Lisa and Nancy. Welcome back into Three Rivers. Well, well, we're not in Three you. Rivers, but you brought us in there now. <laughs> That's cool. We're in Eugene, Oregon today. But I want to tell you, Christy, uh, we've got Doug Whitney. Uh, he's he's a retired Navy commander and a pilot. We've got Mike Guardia. And we have uh, also Nancy Hunter, a different Nancy, on the show. That is Doug's wife. So we're having a party today, apparently. But they wanted to sit in and, and hear a little bit about what you are doing uh, with these wheelchairs because I was trying to explain to them they're like a little ATV really going out there for uh, those in them. Well, they are. But first, can I can I say um, I this may sound cliche, but I do want to thank those gentlemen for their service. If I was nearby, I'd be giving you a shake of a hand and buying you that drink. I heard your earlier interview, and I make sure a point of that. If I see anybody in a military outfit at the airport or wherever I am shopping, I make an effort to go up. Uh, and it's not an effort. It's out of, the, it's out of the, the gratitude of my heart that I like to go up and shake mm-hmm. their hand and thank them for their service. All right, well, thank right. you. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank it you. Is, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, and and. Do you feel the same way also for the families? Because this is something we're trying to really also focus on for the families at home of, of service well, well, people. It's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting you should say that. Uh, you know, Nancy, we're going to have a little problem, I think, with our connection. Um, uh, my, I'm, I'm, Unfortunately, my sound to you is, is a little bit intermittent, so I'm just going to probably talk over you a little bit, and then uh, your, okay. your response hopefully will come back to me. Uh, we're having some difficulty here in, the, in Three Rivers this week. Um, but uh, you talked about the caregivers. That's another program besides the wheelchair that I'm getting involved with is to raise money now to send the caregivers on a week-long retreat because they deserve some uh, a break and they need to be refreshed for everything that they do and the sacrifice that they make. Mm-hmm. That, that is great. Sense. That's great. So, so how many wheelchairs have you been able to raise funds for to date? Uh, I think your question was how many wheelchairs I've given away so yes. far. Is that the question? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. two, two. Uh, they're sixteen thousand dollars, and um, the first time, the first wheelchair took me four years to raise uh, the sixteen thousand, just with uh, car washes and yard sales. And you know, when we say yard sale, we're not talking just what people might think a normal yard sale is. We have people that mm-hmm. donate amazing. Uh, the generosity is just overwhelming. Matter of fact, it takes me a week to set up for it. And um, mm. uh, then we do some fundraisers at Christmas time as well. So uh, the second time, it took me three years to raise that money, and uh, we've given two chairs away. Wow, awesome! That's fantastic because sixteen thousand dollars is not cheap. I mean, that that's a lot of work to get everybody involved, <laughs> and then you ha- you know you get everyone gets to see what happens. Last time, I think you were at the Fox Theater in Visalia, California, when uh, giving. The, was that the first one? I'm not sure about where you were on the second one. Um, yes, that was the first. That was the first one. We had 450 mm-hmm. people show up for that presentation at the Visaya that's Fox fantastic. Theater. That's wow. fantastic. That's cool. So, is it normally uh, the fam? Have you chosen the family before you give the chair away? Oh, we don't, or... we don't... I'm sorry. Go mm-hmm. ahead. Uh, rephrase that question. How, how, this sounds like the Johnny Depp trial. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, no, no, I'm just kidding. But yeah. Um, how how do you choose the family? 
that's going to get the wheelchair. Well, I, I, I work with um, I work with the Independence Fund. They are um, mm. a nonprofit organization in in uh, North Carolina that helps veterans, and they have a, a program there called the Mobility Program, and that's what I got involved mm. with, was trying to get back some normalcy to a veteran who has lost one or multiple limbs. Uh, in his service for our country, and um, they have the mobility program has uh, actually some bicycles as well that they can fit people with. But these all-terrain wheelchairs really um, are for people that uh, and veterans that have you know maybe uh, managed 20 acres of oranges and run a ranch or um, mm-hmm. been very active prior to losing their limbs. So I thought that was more important for me to focus on that and and try to help change their life and give give them back as much normalcy as they possibly can could have. So how can people help you in this? Okay, well, it's it's difficult sometimes if you're not in Three Rivers to help me with, obviously, donations for a yard sale or come and pick up a rag and wash some cars. But you can send money to the Independence Fund. You will get a tax-deductible donation. If you want to help me and my cause with that, you just have to put Christy Wood track chair in in the footnote of your check and they actually oh. are keeping a savings account in my name towards the wheelchairs that I'm trying to raise money for. So awesome. people can certainly do that, and they'll get the tax-deductible donation. Um, but, of course, when you're local, people are now donating things. Uh, we have the yard sale actually coming up this weekend for three days. So oh, I already cool. started as of yesterday. Yeah, we're setting it up, and it's going to run um, May uh, 6th, 7th, and 8th. And um, cool. I hope I have enough time to get it set up because I have so I'm overwhelmed with the generosity and the quality of the items that people are donating. So it's, that's it's exciting. But that's awesome. That's fantastic. And what led you to do this? Like what said, hey, I'm going to raise funds for this? Well, and- I'll tell you exactly what it was. In, 2000, in 2014, I was watching Fox News and Bill O'Reilly, and I'm not afraid to say that out on the airways. <laughs> I was watching that. <laughs> but anyway, Bill O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly can write a check in it. <laughs> Bill, yeah, Bill Riley can write a check in a heartbeat for sixteen thousand dollars, which I think he did. But he also got corporations to get involved, and you know, to get some tax deductible donations. And he gave away a track chair at the end of one of his programs. And the look mm. and the glow on the face of that veteran when he received that chair, oh, cool. that arrow pierced my heart. And I said, I want to do this. But I thought, That's I'm awesome. a nobody. I'm I'm a nobody. Nobody knows me like they know Bill O'Reilly. How am I going to make this happen? And I thought, you know, I'm just going to, I don't care how long it takes. If it takes me, I actually said, if it takes me 10 years, I'm going to raise this money for a veteran. That's so awesome. anyway, it took me four years and I got that, I got that done, but you've worked through the independence fund. And what they do is they vet wounded veterans. They, they don't always know about all the wounded veterans that are out there. So people do have to make contact if they know somebody that is disabled and that might benefit from this chair they need to contact the independence fund the gentleman's name is jeremy and he's in charge of this and he he found a veteran in southern california because i i sort of made it a point saying i really want to give this chair to a california veteran because i live in california and then the mm-hmm. second one we narrowed it down to the, the surrounding three counties of where i live because this most of the money's coming in from these counties local people mm-hmm. that are helping support me at the car wash and the yard sales so we found another young veteran um, last November. We presented it to him at the Hanford uh, Veterans uh, Celebration Day, November 11th, and That's a awesome. very nice young man. And, and so he got his, his track chair. And he's going to go on, actually, and try to get into the uh, Paralympics or the Winter Olympics um, in four wow. years. And do some bob wow. riding. Yeah, this gentleman, gentleman's, uh, you know, paralyzed from the waist down, but he's got a big smile on his face, and he's he's a wow. go-getter, and he's uh, competing. That's, that's cool. awesome. Cool. That's yeah. awesome. I think what's great is that you know they're outside, and and that's something that, you know, it's it's different than someone wheeling you around the house or you know it you mm-hmm. want out. And um, I think that's a big deal. Mike, any any thoughts on on what she's doing, what Christy is doing? Well, Christy, all I can say is God bless you, and I okay. cannot tell you how much I appreciate er- everything that you're doing for our veterans. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, and. And uh, on a completely separate and unrelated topic from the veterans' efforts, uh, yeah, uh, awesome job that you're doing with those horses. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. 
that, that, <laughs> any horse is giddy up. I know, I know. I, yeah. I don't have well, a giddy up song for I have two young daughters, and they are um, crazy about horses. So yeah. yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Here you we know go. that, Lisa. And listen, oh. listen, yeah. Christy. You and I have talked about this. You know, mm-hmm. the, uh, Mike. Mike. He. Mike's one of. He's got good daughters, and and he's a good parent. I'm just vouching for him. And so, if he ever go, you 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 would love them if if they came to Three Rivers to see your horses, and um, and because Christy, you you're not allowed to just get on a horse at Christie's. You will no. go. <laughs> you have to have connection with the horse. You have to. It's awesome. It's a safety thing. You have to get on, walk around, you mm-hmm. know, ride for a bit. Is everybody good? Then you can go out. Like she's really, you have to go through the steps. You can't just be, you know. I, I so respect that, you know, because we used to have our horses in South Africa, and people would want to ride them, and then you're like, oh no, because no. you know, horses horses have their own particular personalities too, just like people, and you have to match them, and it mm-hmm. takes talent for that. So and, and Chrissy has that. She knows. Like, no, no, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. You. Sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, I was just going to say that the reason we, we do that and give you a riding lesson before we actually take you out on the trail is for um, your, your protection. And actually the more knowledge you have, the more fun you're going to have. Exactly. And then it also protects my horses. My horses are very well trained and I, I want people yes. to ride them the way that they're trained. So we right. have to kind of work on our communication for that short time. And then we can go out and see the wonderful world outside of that arena and on the trails. That's why awesome. I do it. And 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 Mike, she's got a book called Ranger that your daughters would love for you to read to them, and with them. I'm just saying. I'm just. Mm-hmm. I gotta give a play for Christy. <laughs> so everyone, <laughs> I go to Christy's website. It is WDN Horse for Wooden Horse, right? WDNHorse.com, and keep up with her there, and also see her Q and A feature and expert page on Blend Radio and TV.com. And when you're there. Uh, Go look up Mike, too. So, uh, Christy, we're going to close with a song. Uh, we've got our next guest joining us from Asheville, North Carolina. So they're outside the Smoky Mountains. And um, so we're going to play a song called Colors of the USA by Doreen and Taylor. Doctor. And this song was written mm-hmm. for the National Park uh, Centennial uh, Celebration mm-hmm. and through the National Park Conservation Association, which is, our interviews with them is what set us on the path of doing our Love Your Park mm-hmm. And... Uh, that's so great. anyway, we're going to play that song, and this is kind of like a National Park anthem, anthem, America's anthem, and part of her whole goal with this is absolutely the beauty of America, but also three-quarters of our park system, our National Park Service system, I should say, because we have over 400 parks, um, three-quarters of them, two-thirds, three-quarters of them have history or are historical parks. There's, there's the right. nature and the history, and so that's why she wrote this song, because she wanted to get people to understand the history of America is in our parks, like places like Gettysburg. Sequoia mm-hmm. National Park, by the way, a Buffalo Soldier, uh, mm-hmm. Charles Young, you know, he was the one who actually put the road in. I was, mm-hmm. he, he yeah. was the very first, uh, he was the acting superintendent. Uh, I think, wasn't he the first African-American superintendent yes. of our parks? Yes. Uh, Charles yes, Young. That's and, correct. Um, that's, mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And so when you think about what our oh I just got goosebumps about him I know because he, it's he, an he, awesome song you know what I I just want to say uh, Mike we've got to do mm-hmm. this Tuskegee Airmen at some point I'm sorry I really oh, want to do a thing on yeah. this because he's also connected to all mm-hmm. of that I, there's like lineage and yeah all of that so anyway here is the song it is called Colors mm-hmm. of the USA then we're going to the Smoky Mountains. Uh, Nancy and Doug had to leave. They've got a party to go see, so we want to thank them on the air for being with us. But here it is, Colors of the USA. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you. God bless America. Take care. Here it is, Colors of the USA, Doreen Taylor, music.com.
everyone, you're listening to Big Blend Radio with Nancy and Lisa and also Mike mm. Guardia, award-winning historian and author and uh, on his 22nd book, The Combat Diaries, out now. So check him out at MikeGuardia.com. And uh, that was Brian Taylor play, singing Colors of the USA and uh, a beautiful, beautiful song. And talk about eagles. The next place we're going is the Smoky Mountain region. And I know they have eagles. Do you have eagles in your backyard area in Minnesota, Mike? Oh, I wish I did. Oh, mm. man. I, well, I'll tell you what. We, we saw get a bald eagle the other day. We, we like, did. We oh. saw that, that was in um, Washington Gosh. State. We saw a bald yeah. eagle fly over. It's right at the beginning of, of a hike. And he yeah. just like, he, he just gave, down. he did the big old whack, you know. I can't yeah, do the bald cool. eagle cry on this show. That one sound good, but hey. like I'm, I have to tell you, I'm still laughing at ACDC in a tank. Like that's crazy, and then having more of them. What's your favorite ACDC song? I've got to know. Like, seriously. oh yeah, um, yeah. My ACDC tune has to be has to be Thunderstruck. Oh my oh. God, see that came oh, out no when I was way. in high school. Yeah, Thunderstruck. <laughs> I remember that. We do. We got in trouble with that song. But anyway, I, Nancy's on the show. I won't say anything now. <laughs> no, I already know. Don't think I don't know. Yeah. You've been 
All right, all right. Everybody, stay tuned. Our, our good friends over in Asheville, North Carolina, are joining us now, and I'm sure I'm going to ask them about their ACDC song. She sings mm. heavy metal, so everybody, stay tuned. Uh, we've got our friends from The Lion and the Rose joining us next. Seriously, now that was the wrong music to play in the introduction after talking about ACDC. Everyone, our next guest is Steve and Karen Wilson. We call them Mr. and Mrs. Wild of Asheville. They're the owners of the Lion and the Rose Bed and Breakfast. Uh, so check it out. Go to lion-rose.com. How are you, Karen? Are you there? Yep, we're good. How are you? Good, we're good. good. Are you, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, good. welcome back, you guys. You? It's been a long time since we've talked. Oh, we're good. Are yeah. Thunderstruck? Yeah, Thunderstruck. Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay ACDC song from the two of you. Which one? Like, come on. This is important military oh, history here. Yeah. Like, back and black. Back and black. They shook me all night long. Yeah, mm. yeah. Oh, oh, cool. See, yeah, all right, all right. So all this, right, this party. next time we'll be playing ACDC on, on the show. Uh, you know, we've got the music on today's show, too, so I'm not saying that, but Glad to have you on the show. Also, uh, I, I don't. I think you guys were on the same show with Mike before. Have you been on the same show? I can't keep up anymore. Everyone's been on shows together. Mm, but, so. Oh well, I don't Mike, think so. Mike meets uh-uh. Steve and Karen, who dare, you know dared us to run their bed and breakfast for three nights, and we all survived. <laughs> <laughs> well, Karen, it's great to meet you both. Yeah. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> so so. You know, Karen, for some reason, I know I texted you, I was like, was Steve in the military? For some reason, I thought Steve was in the military, but no, it was both your fathers were yes. in the Army, right? Correct, yep. yes. Okay, mm. that's awesome. And so, that, Mike, you served in the Army. Mike, were your family, I know you said you you had family in, in the military, were they all Army too, or different ranks, or di- not ranks, what do you call it, different, what do you, what do you call the different teams? <laughs> Different. You mean the different branches? Yeah. Branches. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Most of my family was army. Um, let's see. Yeah. I had a uh, had a great uncle who was coast guard, and uh, yeah, had another uh, had another great uncle uh, related by marriage. Uh, now this guy did a lot of interesting things. He was uh, he served in the U.S. Army and the U.S. Navy, and before that, he had mm. actually served in the Swedish Navy. Oh, really? Wow. wow. Yeah, yeah. So he yeah, walked over so, here. Huh. Yeah, yeah. He he had served in Sweden's military, immigrated to the U.S., and, uh, yeah, did uh, two different stints and two different branches of the U.S. Armed Forces before he married into the family. So, Wow. Cool guy. Wow. Cool. Cool. Have you done your DNA thing where you trace all your family history and stuff? Oh, not yet, not yet, but uh, yeah, we got enough, uh, yeah, but I am aching to do that one of these days, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, it's funny you should mention that, because a few weeks ago, I finally joined Ancestry.com. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. For that's what, that, that very reason, to, do. you know. Yeah, we're mm-hmm. we're saying that's what we're going to do for Christmas, is really find out if yeah. all the family stories are true or not, if it's oh, all rumors. Okay. Yeah. Some of them I hope they are, and others I really yeah. hope they're not. <laughs> Steve and Karen, have you guys done your DNA to find out more about your ancestors? No, have not. No. Oh. No. <laughs> Straight up? No. Okay, come on. That's it. We're all going to do it for Christmas. I think we should we'll all have do, to do it do together. It. We have to all do it together. We can swab and report back. There we go. There you go. <laughs> swab and report back. So Mike, you, you're included in this. You got to swab and report back. So, so you know, this is our military history show. We're talking about Memorial Day. We're talking about you know, military life and what we can do also bridging that gap. And um, you guys, uh, Karen, I am I right that, about this Veterans Day program? Were you part? Mm-hmm. I know Tiffany's Bed and Breakfast and Hot Springs did it. Didn't you do it yes. too, where you guys give a mm-hmm. night away? And I don't know if you yes. mean this here, if it's true, where uh, we do Veterans Day. Tell us yeah, about that. Yeah, we do that. We do that as a um, like a contest or drawing to be fair, because some people will start calling like now, mm-hmm. looking for it. So we just try to make it fair to give everybody a chance to do it. 
And then, mm-hmm. like, the week of uh, Veterans Day, we usually offer some kind of discount for any other rooms we do have open. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's a drawing for a free night. And so yeah. the, mm-hmm. everybody needs to just go to the B&Bs. And this, is that through a, a specific nonprofit, or is that just done individually with the B&Bs? That is, um, it's, it was started by one of the bed and breakfasts that's part of the uh, PI organization. So that's the Professional, Professional Organization of Innkeepers Association. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of them had started that, and they've been doing this, I think, for like 20 years or something, quite a while. Cool. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I, I think yeah. everyone needs to know about that. And can can people sign up for their friends and say, hey, you know, my friend's a veteran and I want them to have a free I, night? Yeah, we all kind of do it different. I think some, some bed and breakfast just take whoever calls first. Like I said, we just kind of get it through email, put them all in a, in a spreadsheet and just draw, random drawing. You know Ozzy and Oreo do it, the little doggies. They're little sixty <laughs> doggies. They go sniff it out. Yeah. yeah. Listen, if you well, have we could try room. that. We could try putting yeah. them all like names in a hat and have them just choose one. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't let it. Yeah, Ozzy, throw them all over the floor. Yeah. yeah. If it if it smells like cookies, Oreo will eat them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Oreo will eat them. <laughs> That's exactly it. So tell us a little bit about your baking for the troops. And and Mike earlier I was asking him on the show about that and he's like when you got care packages it does it, it's a good thing. Um it it's kind mm-hmm. of a nice it, yeah, so tell us about this because I was even wondering like how are you getting baked goods to someone out there, you know, out deployed somewhere. Yep. So um when when the pandemic hit and we had time on our hands, I was just looking for volunteer, virtual volunteer, any kind of volunteer, just so we can spend our time doing something good that normally we don't have time to do. Um, of course, you know, we do animal causes, so that's always mm-hmm. one thing we do. Um, veterans is the other thing that we like to, to give towards. And uh, I came across doing just a search on, on the Internet, Soldiers Angels. They're a nonprofit that does several different programs, um, but the angel baker is what called to me. I'm like, that is so perfect that, you know, bake mm. them good, send them to deploy troops and give them a taste of home and, you know, make them feel like that we still think about them. They're always on our minds and, and we do care, you know, and, and love them. Oh, mm. that's cool. That's cool. So are you doing the brownies? I gotta ask because the brownies are good. <laughs> Actually, so each year so far, I had been doing um, spent, the spent grain chocolate chip cookies, which we use the spent grains from Steve's beer, which we like to reuse yeah. and, and add a different little taste into stuff. Um, mm. This year, I don't know if we're gonna have any spent grain to do that, but I have a little different idea in mind, so it might be more like a a, a big cookie Ooh. thing that I kind of want to put like thank you in there, mm. written in there. Mm. Cool. Oh, yeah, whatever you make mm. is good, you know. So, mm-hmm. Mike, you, as you, if you're deployed, what do you want in the mail, like, cookie-wise? Like, you know, <laughs> if it's baked, what do you want? Like, oh, goodness, let's see. Now. Um, well, let's see. Uh, a heavy favorite was always brownies. Um, mm, yeah, brownies. Yeah, good brownies. Mm. Brownies yeah. are good. Cookies of any variety, um, chocolate mm. chip, sugar cookies. Mm. Um, I found that the uh, type of cookies that traveled the best mm-hmm. were snickerdoodles and also <laughs> ginger snaps. For some reason, Ooh. those uh, they oh. hold up very well in transit yeah. over the mail. Uh, okay. Goodness, let's see. Aside from that, um, cupcakes are nice. They don't tend to travel as well as some of the other baked goods, though. And, uh, yeah, um, aside from any of the variety of baked goods, um, candies, um, any, uh, any number of, uh, any number of packaged and store and store bought snacks are also always welcomed. Uh, Skittles really seems to be a heavy favorite among soldiers I've noticed. Oh, oh. okay. That's good to know. See, it's like Mm -hmm. Skittles and little sour part in it. Yeah, I understand why. Skittles and cupcakes. That's the same problem I have with gummy bears. It's because there's the sweet and the sour, and you want the sweet and the sour. Like <laughs> but, I have that like, same problem. It, well, okay, oh. Mike. I think one of the one of the first shows you were on. Ah, no. I mean, you've been on our shows for years. We talked about M and M's. So, do yeah. I mean? Is, weren't M and M's created for the military? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and they are a heavy favorite among 
a wide variety of service personnel today. As a matter of fact, uh, many of the military's MREs, uh, they come prepackaged with a side of M&Ms. Because they don't oh, melt. They so don't you melt in your hand. Yeah, they don't melt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, well, they don't melt in your hand, but uh, for yeah, but uh, uh, oddly enough, they found ways to melt if I put them in one of my cargo pockets or if I put them in my ammo pouch. <laughs> oh, well, there's, 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 there's yeah. a little bit. Uh, I, was like, well, yeah. I was like, okay, well, I guess I got pudding now. Yeah, and if yeah. you if you uh, <laughs> put them in your glove box in 29 Palms in the summer, they, they melt. melt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, except for to still to this day, I still have a McDonald's French fry in the car. So I, I know. Five we have, I've done a Cheeto. I've done oh no. French fries, and they're still the, the same. Cheeto lasted they're forever. Same. They last forever. Until we had to take it out because of bears. But oh. the Cheeto was, like, long-lasting. It's not real food. I still like them. So. But this is what I want to say about Karen. So Karen made brownies when we were there to to run the B&B. I still, like, we're going to be there in August, people. Sign up, because I give everyone beer mimosas in the morning, and you're supposed to only get them on Sundays. I just want everybody happy and no complaints. <laughs> she made brownies, and we had a honeymoon couple come in, and I'm like, the brownies, they have to be fresh. And she's like, well, the brownies only last for one day. No, they don't. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they're they're they so don't. good they don't last more than a day, though. Well, I know they don't last more, but I mean, like, you can keep them for days, and they just transform into cookies after a while, and they're delicious. So I'm just saying brownies and, could be fun. And sent. I would say the French toast has more in it than what you would think. Just saying. <laughs> well, <laughs> here we go. Here we go. But this is cool. So, so what about yours? You were, you were telling me, sending me texts about this whole program, so you're baking – so do you send them directly to certain places, or do you have to send the – I mean, can anybody join you in this, uh, or is it just for so, ins? Okay, so we, uh, we initially started it to do it for as ins because uh, mm-hmm. the idea was to bring all of us, to, like, something positive to put our energy into, mm-hmm. and just, you know, mm-hmm. since we all had the time, like I said, it was just a way to bring us all together and do something good. Um that's so awesome. initially it was called in I N N support of our troops. Mm-hmm. Um, this year, luckily a lot of us are much busier, so not going to have as many participants. So we just figured anybody we're telling our guests, our friends, family, anybody who would love to jump in and help, they're welcome to join us. Is so there a how deadline? do we do it? Yeah. How do we deadline? do this? Like, what do we do? So, yeah. That's it. Anybody can they can contact us if the, if you have any questions or go to directly to Soldiers Angels. Like I said, they have several other programs. If not baking, there's other things like letter writing. Um, they Aww. do sock Ooh. programs, like sending socks overseas. Um, so what you do is when you sign up, you choose a program you want to participate in. Um, oh. It's a minimum donation of like a dollar, whatever you want to donate, just to get access to their database. Uh, mm-hmm. of the soldiers because it's confide- you know, confidential kind of thing. And then mm-hmm. you choose your soldier and just send your package. Oh, wow, it's been a long time since I chose a soldier. <laughs> oh, see? You oh, can choose more go. than one. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. But, you know, but, but um, no, I'm not going to even go there. Uh, but, the, but honestly, that's really cool. So you can mail it direct and it will go to wherever they're deployed. How does that yes. work, Mike, in regards to things actually getting there? Because like when Doug was talking about it, they had mail at that time. Now there's, there's email, right? right? You could get text messages or yeah. emails for, you know, soldiers out there, men and women out there mm-hmm. fighting like Mike was saying. Yeah. Uh, so is it right. a little so bit easier old. now? Mm-hmm. It is actually a lot easier to get stuff over there now. So um, every unit that has any number of service personnel downrange, uh, they always have a family readiness group. And that family readiness group is uh, tied into the broader program of morale, welfare, and recreation uh, that has an office at every installation. And uh, they are your one stop for um, any way to get any type of mail or any any type of message overseas quick, fast, and in a hurry. 
Uh, you know, the, the USO also has a longstanding partnership with any local organizations that want to send any number of care packages to any number of soldiers who are serving overseas. Um, the, uh, the, first, um, the first stop for all of that incoming mail at an overseas location is going to be a place called the APO, and that is an abbreviation for Allied Post Office. And uh, that is the Army's central mail handling system. And, of course, there are APOs for the other branches of the service as well. Uh, you know, they, uh, they have, each branch of the service has its, uh, has its own mail handler specialty. And uh, whatever that soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine is doing, you know, uh, his or her job is to process all the mail that comes through, process all the packages, and make sure that they – get exactly where they need to be but uh yeah it is uh it is far easier to do that today than it was in years past you know i mean with all mm -hmm. of the instant communications that we have and uh you know every time a unit deploys you know you have such a large logistical apparatus that goes overseas with them you know they 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 uh they're able to set up wi-fi's and and wow. ethernets and uh Cell phone communications, yeah, it's uh, it's very, it's very easy to stay in real time contact today than mm. it yeah, was cool. any number of years ago. Yeah, yeah, I was amazed. I mean, even with what's happening with Russia and Ukraine and Elon Musk, I mean, is it true he really gave them internet over there, like here, put the satellite there, give them the internet, and I don't know, I, I don't want to get no idea, getting in trouble for wrong facts here, but. I mean, it it is pretty amazing, you know. And but to get, I mean, because of the airline carriers, right? And I mean, are we still doing those big aircraft carriers that Doug is talking about? I mean, with oh sure. I mean, holy cow! He said that he yeah. told his sons, like, I don't want you to do it. if you want to do it, but like, don't. It's hard work being an aircraft carrier. He said was one of the hardest things, more than being a well, fighter pilot. And then you have to land on a on a ship. You know, if if you don't land right, you gotta take off and circle dude. around, do it again. I do, no way. That's no insane. seriously. Think about it. It's not a, like a huge long runway that runs forever. Mm -hmm. like, but here it is. I don't know here comes Karen's brownies coming into the aircraft carrier. I know. It's like whoops, got a Karen <laughs> brownie. Okay, gotta, listen. Got to land again. Steve, Steve does the breakfast part. So Steve, I'm just saying a little bacon and the brownies. Like mm. for you know, like what do you mm. think, Mike? Mike, would That's you dig really would you dig that if you were out there? If you got some chocolate and bacon in one place, would that be good? Oh, of course, <laughs> of course. Everybody if it's edible, food. a soldier will eat it. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. Well, <laughs> bacon <laughs> crushed up and sprinkled inside brownie mix is really good. Yeah, if you need s'mores brownies today. Oh. oh. Dude, seriously, you had to bring that up now. Like, this is, we've talked about all this candy and Skittles and brownies. Oh, was it dinner time there, already? There were way too many sweets in the house today between brownies and a wedding cake and, uh, yeah, ooh, ooh, oh, sweet heaven. Yeah, one of those days. Yeah, you guys had a yeah. wedding. Have you ever done a military <laughs> wedding at the end? Have you yes. ever, have you ever oh. like, um, sabotage a wedding cake because you like the icing <laughs> and then you have to rewrite the bride's name? They do no. not do that. And Nancy, you and I both know that from that three days that you don't like. Even when you had the honeymoon couple, I like talk about sweaty palms. Like I freaked out. I'm like I cannot screw this up. Like this is a honeymoon, and this is they, they don't they, you get one honeymoon right unless you decide to take mm -hmm. three. But this is their honeymoon, and this will be perfect. <laughs> and those brownies will be fresh and delicious. And that wine will be positioned perfectly. That glass will be sparkling clean. Polished. You know, it is like so. Well, I'm sure everything. they had other things on their minds besides brownies. Well, but I you know what so. I mean. You know what I mean. You know, but um, I was just trying, like, so, Nancy, no, you don't mess with the wedding cake. You behave. And so, so you guys have done, a, you were saying, Karen, that you have done military weddings there. So that's yeah. going to be like a, Wow. That's that's amazing. That, that was what last year, Steve? The year before? Yeah, yeah. That must the first one I officiated was that one. Yep, mm. that was his first. Steve, 
He was not meant to officiate that. That was kind of by default because the minister didn't show up, and they were kind of – Oh, nice. She was in the military. She had to take leave from Fort Bragg, so they wanted to be married, and we're like, we're getting you married. Don't you worry. Steve is doing it. (laughs) Oh, wait a minute. So you went and got a license to to marry people? Yeah, I'm ordained. We we both are ordained. We did that just in case of an emergency. No, wow, well, and then you. you had to pull it. That's cool. What was that yeah. like? Yeah. What was that like? I want to know. Like, what was, I mean, were you nervous? Well, it was nerve-wracking at first. It was nerve-wracking until they told me I just had to read off a sheet. I said, oh, I can do that. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. But they that's had the okay. and everything, so. So like, that's, that's cool. the thing, right? D- things can change. You know, you could mm-hmm. plan to get married, and all of a sudden the service says we're moving you around. So. Yep. That's got to be hard for, you know, military hmm. weddings and wow. Wow, wow, wow. wow. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, military goes through a lot. Job. Well, you guys, thank you so much for doing what you're doing. I'm, you know, I don't think I'll bake, but I may try letter writing or something <laughs> because baking, <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to write Well, better. you can do it. You can, cool. you can do it. Take suggestions of, of maybe what Mike has there, but they do have other things you can put in the care package like, like, like he said, like, you know, packaged goods, socks, mm-hmm. decks of cards. It's, there's like Angel Soldier or Soldier's yeah, Angels has a pencil, list of other like things you can do. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Cool. I like yeah. That. I like that. Yeah. And, so and you don't Mike, have to what make. About, what about the letter writing? What is that like if you get letters from a stranger? I mean, uh, well, that's a... it's actually quite heartwarming, you know? Um mm-hmm. If you get if you get um, help from anybody, and uh, as a matter of fact, this can tie into some of the things that I think I mentioned when we we did our show on Days of Fury, um, mm-hmm. how a lot of the soldiers on the front lines of Desert Storm uh, w- w- were w- were getting these mountains and mountains of care packages that mm-hmm. were that, that were coming from random people and random civic organizations. And they were quite literally addressed to any soldier. I mean, that's what it mm. said on the box, any soldier. And, uh, wow. yeah, they would just uh, arrive on the front lines in droves. And, yeah, mm. I mm. distinctly remember what one veteran was telling me. He said, you know, uh, one package we got was from an elementary school. And, mm. you know, the kids drew us a slew of pictures. You know, they made us all these cookies oh. and you 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 know they were writing things in the letters. You know they were drawing pictures. You know saying, "Hey, good luck and stay safe over there." And you know, thank mm. you for fighting for us. And wow. uh, you know what 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 struck them and what I think really deserves to be mentioned is that uh, it was a night and day difference from what their forefathers had experienced in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. You know, where uh, yeah. where they where they were experiencing apathy at best and mm-hmm. full out hostility at worst, mm-hmm. you know, from the or from the same people that they were supposed to be representing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow! Yeah. No, I and, and, I remember that, and that was that was harsh. That was mm-hmm. really harsh. Mm-hmm. It it was yeah. harsh mm-hmm. and uneducated and uncalled for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's how I'm going to put it, and I know I'm going to get emails, but there you go. Oh, well. Uh, and World War II, <laughs> I know mean, you did, in, in closing here, the Combat Diaries, True Stories from the Front Lines of World War II is out now by Mike, his sec- 22nd book. I mean, seriously, mm. just go to MikeGuardia.com, go to Amazon. Yeah, I mean, it's insane. It's super cool, and um, I mean, Mike, it, it's amazing how many stories you've gathered and, you know, Hopefully you and Doug will, you know, connect further. Um, but with combat diaries, you know, the soldiers in World War II, when we think about where we are now, we were saying, okay, now we have Internet and Wi-Fi and, you know, you know packages. Like, you know, Karen's brownies aren't going to go get to the soldiers, you know. <laughs> That's not going to happen back then, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's we just got to think. I mean, we've changed so much, and we've also understood we need to do that, and it's, it is care, and I believe you can touch strangers by care, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. Just because you don't meet them in person doesn't mean you don't care. And it also goes with social media. You know, we have all these invisible fights of being horrible to each other, but there's also a lot of good done on social media. We've made friends through social media. I mean, you know, Mike, we know you. 
you yeah. know, and we've never, you know, met in person in all these years in communication. So it's, mm-hmm. um, I think true care is true care. And right. I agree. Thing mm-hmm. today's, um, our, I always put a, a quote of the day on social media because I just feel like, hey, we either have to laugh or have something just to remind us about who we are and where we are. And today's quote is by a what a, a very historic, uh, what do you call it? The, the, Mike, you're going to know, the kid's doctor. I was, is a podiatrist, right? Not, no, that's a foot person. Not the, what, what's the, kid, the kid's doctor? Anyway, Benjamin. Pediatrician. 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 Yeah, pediatrician. yeah, I want to say podiatrist. Mm-hmm. All right, whatever. <laughs> Benjamin Spock. Oh, I got stuck on his name, Benjamin Spock, because then I went to, you know, Spock. <laughs> but the quote of the day was, a human being is happiest and most successful when dedicated to a cause outside his own individual selfish satisfaction. And I think Ooh, that's good really point. true. Yeah. Love that. And I think that really goes with today's show. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Steve and Karen. And can't wait to see you this summer. August, we will be in your house. <laughs> in your yep, looking community. forward to it. Yeah, and yeah. everyone, uh, you'll see Steve and Karen uh, featured in this upcoming issue of Vacation Station magazine, uh, along with 16 other bed and breakfasts uh, that we've uh, had the opportunity and wonderful wonderful experience of being in uh, over the last uh, two years. So check that out. It's coming up. So go to blendradioandtv.com, sign up for our newsletter, and keep up with Steve and Karen at lion-rose.com. We want to close with a song. Uh, I couldn't believe this, you know, talking to you, uh, Karen, earlier. This is mm-hmm. called Song for My Dad, and uh, this is from a uh, Jimmy Yesian. He's been on our show for years. He passed away last year. Mm -hmm. And this is from his uh, final solo album. And the song brings me to tears, and it brings me to tears thinking that Jimmy's not here. Um, I know. I know. It's really – and you can hear his tribute show and his last interview on blendradioandtv.com. Just type in Jimmy Essien. And and his last album was called The Future. Mm. But here it is, Song for My Dad. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Mike, so much for co-hosting. Always appreciate and love having you on the show. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, ladies. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Steve and Karen. Behave. Thank thank you. Bye. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Here it is. Song for my dad. I stumble in one late night. He was waiting up and sat me down. I think it's time you move on, son I pray you turn your life around For years he tried to paint me a picture Every day you waste you won't get back said, life is not a dress rehearsal for another, and the train you're on is running out of track. Now I survived some hard times, and I am finally finding my way. Don't get to talk much Papa hear you every day And when life hangs a cloud I think about you Two years in prison camp World War II Sleeping on a flat wood bed Your helm was your pillow And still you share the last piece of bread Today is not
not the first time I have tried to see you down But it might be my last chance They tell me you're not turning round I have tried to tell you forever How much it's meant to be your son But I was trying to be so damn clever So you never heard But tonight I swear I'm gonna get it Flowers on your grave. 